Hey everyone, thanks for joining our uh, summer school this year. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a PhD student at IBM Quantum in the Zurich lab uh, in Switzerland. And I work on quantum algorithms for uh, the simulation of quantum dynamics uh, with a focus on quantum uh, many body physics and uh, quantum chemistry simulations. Um, my lecture will be about uh, quantum algorithms for quantum dynamics. Um, and I will mostly talk about algorithms, but finish off also with an application example in quantum chemistry and with a code example using uh, some Qiskit functionalities to implement some of the algorithms that you saw in this lecture or that you're going to see in this lecture. <clears throat> right, so as a uh, quick overview, we'll first do a quick recap of quantum dynamics and why it's important to simulate it um, and define some terminology terminology of open and closed systems and real and imaginary time evolution, although you will be concerned mostly with uh, closed systems and uh, real time evolution to them. Um, after we will go to the main part of this lecture, namely uh, discuss algorithms, uh, defining some terminology again uh, in the beginning, and then um, discussing uh, product formulas, linear combination of unitaries, uh, Qubitization, as well as some variation of methods uh, at the end. And uh, in the third part of this lecture, we will talk about uh, applications. Um, I will briefly uh, state how we do research uh, every day. So what goals we have and um, how we approach a problem or choose a problem in the first place. Um, then I'll make uh, the example of quantum chemistry uh, and molecular dynamics in particular. Um, and finish with a code example that some of you might have seen already in the quantum challenge uh, this spring. All right, so before I dive in, um, let me give you some literature recommendations. So the first one is this paper by Mario Motta and Julia Rice uh, from IBM Research in uh, Almaden. It's um, a very, very nice review of uh, quantum dynamics within quantum chemistry uh, and the simulation thereof. Um, it gives uh, a good overview of uh, why these simulations are relevant for quantum chemistry. And then it also discusses um, quite comprehensively and a bit of technical detail um, some of the algorithms that we're also going to see in this lecture, like uh, product formulas and qubitization and so on. Um, then there's a second review, which I can recommend this one, um, which is much more broad than the first one. Uh, but it's, it gives a very comprehensive overview of quantum chemistry or quantum computing for quantum chemistry in general, um, covering also lots of dynamics. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good reference to get a general overview. Um, and then lastly, in self-promotion, there's also this paper by uh, me and my colleagues, uh, which uh, we submitted recently and will hopefully be published uh, in the not so far future. So keep an eye out for this um, in case you're interested. And uh, lastly, there's also these uh, standard textbook examples uh, for just getting into quantum mechanics, uh, quantum computing and info, and also uh, some quant open quantum systems uh, literature in case you're interested in that. Um, as a disclaimer, um, all of the reference that you'll see in this uh, in this lecture, they will also always be uh, appearing here at the bottom right, and um, it will always be open access uh, references. Okay, so even if the paper has appeared in the peer reviewed journal, I will give the open access uh, reference so that everyone can just uh, look for this reference that I give here and access it without having to have any sort of subscription through a university or so. Okay. <clears throat> So let's do a quick recap on quantum dynamics. Um, why is it important to simulate these things? Um, let's stay on the example of quantum chemistry. Um, a lot of experiments in quantum chemistry uh, use uh, some kind of spectroscopy, right? Uh, so spectrosco spectroscopic experiments are extremely widely uh, used in quantum chemistry um, to extract uh, certain information about uh, molecular compounds or materials. And essentially what you do is uh, you take some chemical system, say a molecule, and you um, probe it with, uh, with light, with laser pulses or, or so, 
Um, so here you might have this laser pulse impacting your molecule and as a reaction to this uh, perturbation, your molecule might excite to a different uh, energetic state, um, evolve for some time, and then de-excite and uh, radiate away um, uh, light of a certain frequency again. Um, one measures this light and from this measurement, uh, one extracts uh, the information that uh, one is looking for. So we can model this process also computationally. So we can do a computational experiment, so to say, and we proceed very similar to uh, a chemist or a physicist in a lab. So we prepare an initial state of our molecule, which computationally we encode with some mathematical representation in our computer. Then we perturb our system. So this would correspond to this uh, laser pulse, for instance, uh, and let the system evolve uh, for some time t, which computationally means we have to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay. In the end, um, we do a measurement. In the lab, this corresponds to uh, measuring this uh, radiation that comes off of the molecule, for instance, um, and we get some uh, distribution of uh, frequencies with different intensities, and uh, so the spectrum uh, from which we can extract information. In a computer simulation, we would uh, take our time evolved state uh, and compute uh, the expectation value of some observable O um, within the state, okay? And then from this, we, uh, we get the information that we're looking for, hopefully. Um, this is very difficult to do, um, but it's very important to do that um, because um, for one, maybe you want to model a system which you cannot easily um, do experiments on. So you want to uh, maybe look at the molecule completely isolated from any environment, which uh, is ideally done in, in a computer, but very hard to do in, in an experiment in the lab. Um, or maybe you want to validate experiments that you've done in the lab, right? So you, you've done a very complicated experiment and you are not sure if, it, uh, if the results that you get are trustworthy. So you might want to uh, aid this experiment with, uh, with computer simulations to see if uh, within this computer simulation where you can control or have control over every parameter, you get uh, a similar result uh, as in the experiment. Okay, and of course, we hope that quantum computing here can uh, do better simulations or simulations more efficiently that are otherwise too hard to do on uh, normal classical computers. All right, so quickly on the terminology that is often encountered in uh, quantum dynamics. Um, so when we talk about closed systems, we mean the standard system that everyone encounters in their undergrad studies. Um, so you have a system which is completely isolated, described by this wave function, a pure state, um, a state vector, uh, what we call it, and its dynamics is governed by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, okay? Um, on the other hand, an open system is a bit different as you essentially look at your system, so say the molecule embedded within a larger environment, okay? Um, so uh, this interaction uh, with the environment causes the system to be um, to be not in one single um, pure state like here, but instead be in this um, in this ensemble of of states uh, with each with a certain probability pi, and then this mixed state uh, is called uh, or this is called a mixed state, and it's represented not by a state vector or a wave function anymore, but instead by this operator, uh, which we call the density matrix, okay? Um, now, the evolution of this density matrix is uh, governed by uh, this so-called master equation, um, where the evolution of this, uh, of, of this uh, density matrix essentially um, is uh, composed of two parts. So here you have the evolution of the system itself, so the molecule, for instance. And then you have the second term here, which we call the Lindbladian, um, which is an operator function of your of your uh, density matrix describing or aiming to model all of the interaction that happens with this larger environment, okay? So then 
there's also the difference between real and imaginary time evolution and um, just real time evolution is the very intuitive and standard kind of time evolution that you think about intuitively. Um, so you let your system evolve for some time t. Um, for time in independent Hamiltonians, this is computed by solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And the solution is given by having this initial state and acting on it with this time evolution operator. Um, on the other hand, for time dependent Hamiltonians, which for instance, uh, you would get if you would model this uh, process of uh, of shining a laser pulse onto your molecule, uh, as I sh showed before as a quick example, then of course this laser pulse is time dependent and this means your Hamiltonian might also be time dependent. Um, in that case, the solution of the time dependent Schrodinger is not as simple as this, but instead you have to account for the fact that your Hamiltonian at different times might not commute. Uh, so the fact that H at T1 might not commute with H at T2, okay? And due to this fact, you have to uh, introduce this more complicated exponential here with uh, this time ordering operator, which essentially prescribes uh, an order to uh, your Hamiltonian at different times, okay? Just as a side note. Um, on the other hand, imaginary time evolution is very different. It has very little to do with uh, the intuitive picture of time evolution, but instead it's it's merely a mathematical trick to compute stationary or thermodynamic properties of uh, of a system. Okay, so this is achieved by essentially in this uh, so or in your time dependent trading equation, you replace. Your, uh, your time times the complex unit i with this uh, new uh, imaginary time tau, which is just a new parameter, but it's implicitly assumed to be imaginary. And this yields this new propagator, right, which replaces this one. Um, but now you might already know that this is not unitary anymore, and so the evolution under this uh, operator is uh, not norm uh, conserving, okay? Um, so, uh, what this does, though, is that if you um, apply it to a um, to an initial state, you can very easily check yourself. Uh, I'm not going to show it here, but if you apply this to an initial state, then it will exponentially suppress excited energies, and it will, uh, for large uh, tau, this will converge to the ground state. Okay, um, so. Uh, this is what it, one application of imaginary time evolution is to compute uh, ground states or ground state properties of your system. Um, so about this non-unitarity, very quickly, um, although this is not unitary, this operator, the combined action of applying this operator and renormalizing your state is unitary again. And so on a quantum computer where we can only implement unitary operations, um, this combined action can again be implemented approximately. And sorry that I forgot to put it here, but there's a nice reference uh, with an algorithm uh, for exactly this uh, by Mario Motta. And I'm sure if you just search for his name uh, on Google Scholar um, or in some paper repository, uh, you can find this paper. It's quantum imaginary time evolution. That's what it's called. All right. So let me um, start uh, discussing some algorithms. But before I dive into details, why do we need algorithms in general? So why is it important to even uh, come up with algorithms? The reason is that um, generally we want to simulate this time evolution, right? And for this, we have to prepare an initial state and then apply this unitary time evolution operator. This looks very simple if written like this, but in fact, this Hamiltonian here, this H, which governs uh, all of the quantum mechanics in your system, can be extremely complicated, uh, an extremely complicated operator, and uh, can typically not be implemented uh, exactly uh, as one quantum gate, for instance, okay? 
The reason for this is that uh, at IBM and in many different uh, places where quantum computers are developed, people work on digital quantum computing, which means that every operation is uh, essentially compiled into a set of basis gates, okay? So no matter how complicated the operation, you always break it down into a small number of, uh, of elementary uh, operations or gates, uh, which then make up your uh, larger, more complicated operation, okay? Um, and so if we have an, an exponential like so, where uh, you have uh, some coefficient here uh, and then some uh, sum of Pauli terms, uh, this can typically not be be uh, decomposed into these uh, single or two qubit gates, uh, which might be native to our hardware uh, exactly. And instead we have to make an approximation. And the fact that we have to make an approximation comes from the fact that typically when you have an exponential of an operator sum or a matrix sum, this does not decompose into such a product in the case that these operators do not commute. Um, but we will learn more about this uh, in a few minutes when we go into product firmness, okay? So the take home message here is, this is extremely complicated, typically cannot be implemented or decomposed exactly into um, basis gates of your hardware. And so we need good algorithms that have the smallest error possible when decomposing this into basis operations, okay? Right, so then um, some terminology. Um, in the literature, you often read about long and near-term methods, okay? Um, Long-term methods are supposed to be methods where um, you require long circuits, so many, many quantum gates to execute your algorithm, uh, and possibly also many ancilla qubits uh, on top of your uh, qubit register representing your state. Um, and this is not feasible with the quantum hardware that we have right now or will have in the near future, but may only become possible once we have fault-tolerant quantum computers just because the resources required for these algorithms are so large, okay? Um, on the other hand, um, near-term methods are usually hybrid methods where you split the workload between a quantum computer and a classical processor. Um, and with this, you often achieve a, a reduction of the circuit depth uh, to the extent that your circuits are so uh, short that you can run them even on the hardware that we have right now for small systems. Um, or on the noisy kind of hardware that we'll have in the near term, okay? So this is a good distinction, but the problem is that it's not always clear which algorithm fits into which of these two categories. And in particular, it might be the case that one algorithm is con considered a long-term method, but then for certain applications, so for certain systems that you simulate, it's much more efficient than for others, and so it suddenly becomes near-term again or possible to, to simulate on near-term hardware. Okay, so product formulas, which we'll discuss after this, uh, are a good example because um, for some systems, they are very efficient and can be executed on the hardware we have right now. Well, for other simulations, they require so many uh, quantum gates that uh, it's completely impossible to even think about them with our current hardware, okay? Um, so instead, what uh, what we use as a terminology in this unpublished uh, paper that I told you about before is uh, the distinction between decomposition and variational methods. Um, so the difference here is that uh, decomposition they aim at uh, approximating your unitary time evolution operator with a um, unitary that uh, that decomposes this exponential uh, to some accuracy epsilon, okay? So as efficiently as possible. Um, the way that these methods are constructed um, guarantees that you have a scaling loss, asymptotic scaling loss that uh, tell you something about the scaling of the resources that you require to implement this algorithm. Um, as a function of your system size or your accuracy or your um, evolution time. So this is extremely useful because it allows you to estimate the cost of your simulation and also the accuracy dependent on the cost or vice versa. 
Um, so before you even do a simulation, you can already estimate the cost of it and to which accuracy you'll be able to, to carry out the simulation. Um, on the other hand, variational methods are um, those where typically the wave function or the time evolved wave function is directly approximated with a parameterized uh, state. Um, and so, um, say you have uh, your time evolution Then in variational methods often, or usually this is directly approximated with some kind of parameterized unitary acting on some reference state, okay? Sometimes also uh, you get that this operator is approximated with a, um, with, a uh, uh, with a parameterized circuit, but what's common to all of these methods is that these parameters are assumed to be time dependent. And so depending on your algorithm, you have different update rules to obtain these parameters at, uh, at, at all time steps, okay? Now the important uh, difference to decomposition methods here is that this variational nature and the fact that you have to find a good ansatz here to represent your, your true evolution uh, is very system dependent and more so it is heuristic. Um, so it does not give you rigorous uh, scaling laws for the cost of your simulation and also for the accuracy. So essentially you can never know prior to your simulation um, what or how many resources you need to for which accuracy um, or uh, which type of ansatz will give which accuracy or which uh, resource cost, okay? Um, so this is a major drawback of these methods, but as I said, this iterative nature of, of them, so you prepare a variational state on your quantum computer, and then measuring some certain things on your quantum computer, you can feed them to a classical machine and compute the parameters for the next time step and kind of go back and forth like this. Um, a lot of the work is outsourced to a classical machine, and so um, the quantum computation becomes much cheaper and uh, maybe feasible for uh, for near-term hardware and problems that would not be feasible on near-term hardware with decomposition methods, okay? Um, but yeah, the the bottom line here is take it with a grain of salt, um, these methods, because, uh, because of this uh, heuristic nature of, of them, okay? All right. So um, we'll start going over the algorithms um, and we'll start with uh, decomposition methods, okay? So let me quickly um, tell you that uh, I will talk about uh, different algorithms. And for each algorithm, I will have an intro slide like this, where I give you a quick overview of the algorithm and uh, its most essential features and essentially how it works without explaining why it works the way it does. Um, so this is supposed to uh, to give you kind of a take-home message independent of uh, your background of, or your level of education. Um, but then after I will go into a bit more technical detail and also do a few derivations here uh, like by handwriting um, where I try to explain a few of these uh, features of these algorithms, okay, in, in more technical detail. Um, if you feel that you are lacking the, the level of, uh, of understanding required to follow these derivations that come after these intro slides, feel free to skip ahead. Um, at, every, uh, at the end of every algorithm subsection, there is a small summary of their pros and cons again. Uh, and then after discussing the algorithms, there's also this application part. So um, yeah, don't uh, get scared away if it gets a bit technical at some point. It will always go back and forth between uh, less and more technical parts. Okay, so the first algorithm that we discuss are product formulas. Um, product formulas are probably the most straightforward and intuitive approach to implement uh, this time evolution operator uh, or approximate this operator. Um, and if you have heard of uh, trotterization or trotter um, 
decomposition or uh, Trotta Suzuki or Lee Suzuki formulas, all of this uh, is the same. All of these are product formulas, okay? Um, the idea is we have a Hamiltonian which is composed of a sum of operators like we usually encounter in chemistry or physics, uh, a sum of Paulis, um, and you want to approximate this exponential, okay? Um, the first thing you do is you break your evolution down into smaller time steps, uh, t over n, so n time steps, and you uh, repeat this uh, exponential with a smaller time step n times, okay? Um, so uh, this is exact and it will give you essentially uh, this operator, okay? Now, what's inside here is still very complicated and cannot be implemented exactly, and here comes the approximation, okay? Um, if you plug in this sum into your uh, exponential, um, what you get is uh, this exponential of the sum, obviously, uh, and the approximation here is that you write this as a product of uh, exponentials of each of these terms individually, okay? Now, remember this is an approximation due to the fact that not all of these operators VL commute, okay? And so, um, so you cannot uh, write this as a product exactly. Um, the error of this uh, of this approximation um, now scales with uh, t square over n times uh, times all of these. Uh, all of these um, commutators between different uh, terms of your Hamiltonian, okay? So um, I guess here the, the take-home message is um, the error of this approximation um, is very dependent on the structure of your Hamiltonian, so on the, the number of commuting terms that you have in your Hamiltonian, and this is the fact that uh, this is the reason why these simulations are very, or the error of these simulations and the cost is uh, also very system dependent. So in some cases you will have uh, a lot of commuting terms in your Hamiltonian and so you can implement this very cheaply and very accurately. And in, in other cases uh, you will have to uh, bring down the error of this uh, approximation by increasing uh, your time steps, okay? So um, what this looks like the end is you approximate your evolution operator with this uh, product of simpler exponentials. And instead of having to implement this uh, complicated gate now, you implement these uh, these simple uh, exponentials as gates, um, where these are by construction um, exponentials that you can implement with your uh, basis gates on your hardware, okay? And then you repeat this, uh, this circuit n times, where n is the number of time steps, and the number of time steps also uh, gives you control over the error of this uh, of this approximation, okay? So, very briefly, in summary, the more time steps, the more gates you need, so the more costly your, your uh, simulation, but also the more accurate your simulation, because this error, this error here depends inversely on n. Okay, so let me go into um, a bit more uh, technical detail, okay? So, um, as I told you, this, um, this is a straightforward decomposition into a simple exponential. Oh, sorry, I, um, let me add a page here, into simple exponentials. And let me show you quickly why uh, this error depends on the commutator, okay? so. Recall that for e to the a plus b, we cannot simply write e to the a times e to the b if a and b do not commute, okay? Now, there's a very neat formula called the baker kempel hausdorff formula, which I will just abbreviate here. Um, but essentially, this can kind of be inverted to the Sassenhaus formula. And this tells you uh, how to exactly decompose this exponential into um, a product of, uh, of exponentials, namely, 
So e to the t a plus b is e to the t a, e to the t b. And then, in fact, you get an infinite series of uh, or product of uh, exponentials, where first you have this term minus t squared over 2 with the commutator a b. Then you have a term where you have t to the 3. Um, and then this double commutator plus more terms here, and then more uh, more terms in this uh, product in the end. Okay, and so from this you can then say, okay, if I have uh, some operator A, which is a sum of of uh, operators, then e to the t times the sum would be following the Stassenhaus formula here, um, would be the product over all of these uh, simple exponentials, okay, now times the product of all of these commutators, and then times all of the rest that's coming here, okay, which we don't care about for now. Now, this to first order in t is 1 minus t squared over 2 times the sum of all of these commutators, okay? Um, so this is simply uh, Taylor expanding these exponentials and then uh, writing down uh, all of these sums, okay? Um, and so what you get, so this is uh, or actually to to second order. Um, so what you now get is that um, if you uh, so this is then your product again. Okay, times this so plus some constant times t square over this sum of all of these commutators, okay? And so essentially the error of this approximation um, is, so say here you have approximately that this is equal to this product plus some error which goes with order um, t squared over the sum and then uh, some uh, operator norm uh, of all of these commutators, okay? And so here uh, um, you see that uh, this, this error is dependent on the, the structure essentially uh, of your of your operator uh, sum, which in our case is the Hamiltonian. And so if the Hamiltonian has a lot of uh, terms that commute mutually or with each other, uh, then of course this error might be uh, much smaller than in a case where none of these terms commute with each other, okay? Right, so uh, this is summarized here. Um, I told you we, we uh, expand this exponential or this unitary time evolution operator in a series of time steps and then approximate it with this, uh, with this product of exponentials and we get um, a term to leading order that looks like this. Um, most generally, the error of this approximation scales with the number of Hamiltonian terms square, which you get from this uh, commutator here, uh, times t squared over, uh, so t is your total simulation time, and divided by n, the number of time steps, if you exponentiate this whole thing by n, okay? And so the error and vice versa, also the simulation cost of this um, can be reduced, uh, sorry, the error can be reduced by um, having 
uh, more time steps, essentially. Uh, but vice versa, the simulation cost grows with uh, the number of time steps, okay? All right, um, so there are other ways to bring down the error of this approximation. Um, one way is to uh, go to higher order product formulas. So this expansion that I showed you before, the Stassenhaus formula, essentially uh, don't stop at the first order in T, but go to higher orders. Uh, and then you find a second order product formula, which is uh, this, uh, these two products of, uh, of you, your easy to implement or simple exponentials. And then higher orders uh, of order 2K plus two, so only even orders, so of order four or order six and so on um, are obtained recursively by using the second order formula, okay? Um, so just for completeness here. Um, then there's a second or another way which uh, maybe comes to mind. And for this, let me briefly um, give you an example, okay? so. Say we have um, some uh, operator here. Uh, say this is just the sum of e to the alpha i times v i, okay? Some sum of operators. Um, and so this sum alpha i v i, it's alpha one v one plus alpha two v two and so on. But it's a sum, right? You might as well write alpha 13 V13 plus alpha 48 V48 plus alpha 1 V1 and so on, okay? You can reshuffle as you like. You can also do this in this exponential here, but now if you approximate this, um, so, if you approximate this as, uh, sorry, um, as this product of easier exponentials, then suddenly you have that e to the alpha one v one, e to the alpha two v two, and so on. This is not anymore just e to the alpha 2 v2, e to the alpha 80, 38, uh, v38, and so on. So you lost the freedom of uh, reshuffling this because in generally these v's do not commute, okay? And so you go from a case where you can reorder this uh, as you like to a case where it matters which order you choose. And so you can think that maybe the naive order of going uh, V1, uh, then V2 and so on might not be the one that gives you the lowest error. And so there has been a lot of work and, um, on uh, reordering these terms and finding an optimal way or simply um, randomizing the order, okay? Um, so for instance, uh, there's an algorithm which implements this um, called QDrift. Uh, and here the, um, or sorry, let me say there are numerous algorithms where um, these product formulas are randomized in their order uh, in some way. But then there's also QDrift, which um, which samples uh, from all of these exponentials. So, so it, it says, okay, I have all of these simple exponentials here. And then depending on the weight of each term in the Hamiltonian, I sample, um, different exponentials and with this construct my random uh, unitary time evolution operator, okay? And with this, uh, there's, or this algorithm achieves an error scaling which is independent of the number of Hamiltonian terms. Uh, and so it, it can be advantages for, for certain cases to consider uh, such randomized uh, product formulas. So the reference for this is, uh, for QDrift is uh, this Kempe references, okay, by Earl Kempe. Okay, so in summary, uh, product formulas are very simple and intuitive and also versatile. You can do time-dependent Hamiltonians or time-independent Hamiltonians with them. Um, you don't require ancilla qubits. And what's most important, uh, you have this dependence of the error on the 
commutator structure of the Hamiltonian, which in practice often gives you much better accuracy and lower cost than you would um, expect from these asymptotic scaling laws, okay? On the downside, the asymptotic scaling laws are still pretty bad. So compared to other algorithms that I will talk about uh, now uh, after this, um, the scaling laws are uh, much worse. And so generally the gate counts are much higher than in these other algorithms. Um, and if you have Hamiltonians in first quantization, product formulas are impractical to say the least, uh, because there you encounter algebraic expressions of your uh, coordinates um, uh, and exponentiating these, which you have to do in order to implement them as a product formula, can be extremely inefficient and uh, hard to do uh, for certain uh, Hamiltonians, for instance, for a Coulomb potential in your Hamiltonian. Okay, so that's uh, all about product formulas. So um, next I want to discuss a uh, linear combination of unitaries. Um, this is an algorithm that appeared in 2014. And um, the general idea is that um, you have a Hamiltonian given uh, as such a sum uh, of unitaries now. All of these U's are unitary. Uh, so uh, that's the case normally when we have a sum of Paulis, uh, for instance. Uh, and then instead of decomposing this as with product formulas into a product of, in, in, uh, of exponentials, you now tailor expand your unitary time evolution operator, uh, like so, to a given uh, order k. Um, and what the linear combination of unitaries uh, algorithm does, it essentially prescribes you uh, a method to uh, to now implement this Taylor expansion of your time evolution operator, where you essentially construct such a circuit where you have one ancilla per two terms that you want to sum, and then through a first a zero and then a one control, um, you essentially implement or apply two unitaries uh, onto your like initial state, which will yield uh, something like uh, um, u1 plus u2 on your initial state, only in the case when also in the end here, you measure your ancillas in a zero state, okay? So this is important. Uh, you can construct circuits like this uh, to implement such a linear combination of unitary operators. Um, but in the end, uh, you need to project an ancilla state onto uh, the zero state, okay? And so in this construction here, you need um, many ancillas, namely you need k times the logarithm of, uh, of L, so the number of uh, Hamiltonian terms, uh, ancillas. And um, all of these have to be measured in zero, which means that the success of this implementation um, decreases quite rapidly. And so uh, in a practical scenario, you would have to uh, do many measurements and so run many of these circuits to eventually end up with uh, all zero uh, uh, ancillas, okay? Um, now, maybe I should have mentioned that, but. I guess it was also kind of clear. Of course, this this linear combination of unitaries is itself not unitary necessarily, right? Uh, or generally not not unitary, which is why you need to go through uh, this uh, whole process. Okay, so let me go into a bit of more uh, in a bit more detail. So as I said, you expand or you take your Hamiltonian to be in this sum of unitary operators. And then you expand uh, your time evolution operator um, uh, with this Taylor series uh, to some order k, which will determine your accuracy, okay? And then, of course, you plug in this Hamiltonian here, and uh, you get this uh, huge sum of, of unitaries, okay? Now, um, this is not unitary, but each of these terms is unitary, and so you can implement it with a circuit like this, as I was telling you before. And um, I want to quickly show you uh, that this circuit indeed um, gives you uh, 
the desired outcome, okay? So say you have an operator A, which is equal to the sum of two unitary operators, okay? But A is non-unitary, okay? Then this circuit that I was showing you before, so um, let's see if I can, uh, I can just copy this. Uh, yes, perfect. Um, so this circuit here, okay, I want to show you now that this indeed gives me um, gives me a times phi, which is u1 plus u2 times phi. So phi is uh, this initial state here. Uh, in the case that all of these ancillas are measured in zero, okay? So, let's write this uh, circuit down, okay? Start from uh, the back here and then uh, go to the front. So, first we have this Hadamard, then we have this controlled uh, operation for U2, okay? So, we have... Um, Uh, an identity in the case of uh, zero plus u2 applied if the ancilla is one, okay? This is a one control. Then we have the next or the, then we have this uh, u1 controlled uh, unitary. So identity if it's uh, one and in the case that the ancilla is zero, we apply uh, u1 to the main register, okay? And then, um, of course, in the end, we have another Hadamard plus uh, times our ancilla state and our reference state, okay? So, now, this is equal to 1 over 2 times 0, the ancilla, u1, our reference state, plus one phi okay this here so without the Hadamard is equal to one over square root of two and then zero u one phi plus one u two phi okay if you're unsure whether this is correct uh, write it down yourself and you'll see uh, that it is correct now, applying this Hadamard will again result in uh, this plus and minus state for these uh, ancilla states here. So we have a 1 over 2, because we get another square root of 2 now, times 0 plus 1, u1, phi, plus which is the same as the following. We can just reshuffle these terms and get Okay, and so you see here that, I mean, in the case that we project, say, this is phi tilde, okay? Ah, sorry. In the case that we project this onto the zero state of the ancilla, what we get is one half times u1 plus u2 times phi, okay? And so here's the crux now. So you see the circuit indeed uh, yields our a linear combination of unitaries, which itself is non-unitary, but it only does so if we measure this ancilla state in zero, okay? Right, so as a summary, um, I mean, if we were to do this with uh, like an arbitrary sum uh, or an arbitrarily long sum, 
um, we can uh, be a bit more clever in the way that we implement uh, this and uh, do the following. That's how it's being done in the in the literature. Um, so we can construct these uh, prepare and select operators. And essentially, this looks abstract, but it's very simple to check these two next lines that I'm going to show. This prepare oracle essentially just um, encodes in an ancilla state um, the uh, the label of of each of these or the index of each of these terms. Okay, the select uh, operator does the following, namely, it's a controlled operation, so it it's a control on um, on these. Uh, ancilla states, and the target is the main register, um, and the select oracle applies each term of of this sum here ul to the main register if all of the ancilla uh, or if the ancilla state is in uh, the respective uh, label state or index state l. Okay, um, so it implements exactly this operation. And what you can now check yourself is that if you combine these prepare and select operators in this way, what you get applying them to um, an ancilla state zero here, uh, which is now a bunch of ancillas, not just one, times your initial state, you end up with um, with this uh, state here uh, transferred with the zero ancilla state. And so if you again project this ancilla state onto the zero state, uh, then you have implemented or succeeded in implementing this linear combination of unitaries, okay? Now, of course, to do this for uh, this sum here requires many ancillas, namely, uh, so, namely, in the order of k times log 2l, where k is, uh, k is this, and L is the number of Hamiltonian terms, okay? And so you see many ancillas and they all have to be in the z or measured in zero. Um, so concluding, um, it has better scaling, this algorithm than product formulas um, asymptotically. Um, and it can be used for time dependent Hamiltonians also. So um, this is uh, definitely nice because it adds some versatility to the algorithm. But it does require a ton of ancilla qubits, and more importantly, it has this exponentially decreasing success probability um, due to the fact that all of the ancillas have to be measured um, in zero. Okay. Nevertheless, this algorithm is uh, is uh, of great advantage uh, to this whole community because, I mean, generally it um, it provides a method to implement these linear combinations of unitaries, which extends also the reach of quantum computing to non-unitary operations which can be composed of uh, of as a sum of unitary operations okay um, so this is uh, important to to keep in mind and we will see this algorithm pop up again in cubitization